You know, all reports from China suggest that the economy is far worse off than the mandarins in Beijing would uh, want the world to believe. Uh, how does this growing economic stress, in your view, impact Xi's decision making on the national and international arena? It's a very good question, Rahul. I don't think I think anyone who tells you they have a clear, clean answer for that uh, is is not being honest. We don't know. Look, firstly, the Chinese economy is in real trouble. Uh, they, they, I've been writing about this for a while and saying this for a while. I think now people might be <laughs> exaggerating. I mean, now I'm hearing people talk about China collapse. But what's really significant about it is it makes you realize that at the, at the core of what is happening in China is that the people don't trust their government. So the most significant statistic I've seen about the Chinese economy is that in the last five or seven years, household savings have gone up 50 percent. In other words, people are putting their, their, their money in savings accounts. Effectively, they're hiding it in mattresses. Why? Because they don't believe the government will be able to handle the real estate situation. They don't believe that government will be able to handle the debt overhang. And most importantly, they don't believe the government is being honest with them. So the Chinese have done something quite remarkable for a major economy. They've stopped providing data on, because they know that the data is going to look very bad. And so they've just stopped providing economic data in, in many key areas. And that's, you know, that once you scare the, the, the you know, the psychologically uh, people, consumers, in, uh, investors, uh, entrepreneurs, can you get it back? This is where it's different from Japan in the, in, the, in the 90s. Japan in the 90s was having policy problems. Japanese government didn't know how to handle them. But Japan was not an opaque dictatorship. And so this is the, the part we have to look at. Now, will it lead China to moderate its, uh, its foreign policy? Or will it lead it to say, we need to gin up some nationalism, where we're losing the legitimacy we had because of economic growth? Uh, and as a result, we're going to, you know, uh, saber rattle over Taiwan. You've seen countries do both, um, you know, so it's difficult to tell. And particularly in a system where decision making is largely made by one person, it's very hard to, to say in general what would happen. I mean, if you look in the broad sweep of history, when you, when you, when you become less powerful, you become less active on the world stage. You know, Britain and France became less active, but less powerful in the, the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and they withdrew from their empires. Now, they, they, in some cases, withdrew kicking and screaming, and there was a fair amount of turmoil in places like Vietnam and Algeria. Um, but they did, they eventually they became less, less important as, as world players. I, I think you can't, you can't say with Xi where he will go, because he, really more than anywhere, maybe since Mao, we have not seen a Chinese leader with this much consolidated power. And so we're all trying to read the tea leaves of this one man. There's a big debate in international think tank circles about whether China is now a declining power. The fundamental idea that rising powers can afford to bite their time, but declining powers are tempted to take their chances. Recently, when bad folks have problems, they do. China's economic fortunes wobble. Do any of you? We do. Uh, again, as I say, it's a little hard to tell, and I'm not about China. Uh, quite yet as a declining power. I think it's it's likely to, you know, China is already, it is the second largest economy in the world by far. Uh, number four put together. It has a huge military that uh, it has a veto in the Security Council to disappear, even if China moderates its growth percent or something like that. Uh, but it does seem that the enormous power it gained from, for example, having these massive uh, surpluses, from being able to be the uh, the importer of the world's of all the world's commodities, the, the largest trading partner of all countries, all, all that may begin to wane. And so then the question is: Does it begin to think it has a window of opportunity with Taiwan that will that will be foreclosed? Look, I think this a lot depends here on how the world reacts. And I think that the Biden administration deserves a lot of credit 
for having put together very quietly, uh, but very firmly, a kind of uh, deterrence policy. Whether you look at the Quad, whether you look at the uh, the, uh, the recent summit with uh, Japan and, and Korea, if you look at the talks the U.S. has had with the Philippines to be able to do more uh, with their military. These are all building blocks that are just saying to the Chinese, there would be a heavy price to pay. And looking at what the price Russia has paid, I'm sure Beijing understands that it would be a seismic event if it were to invade Taiwan. Uh, and it would trigger a, a, a series of sanctions and things like that that would be very painful. So I think the best you can do in this situation is not try to predict which way it will go, but to try and put in place building blocks that give the Chinese every incentive to do what they've done for the last you know, 60, 75 years, which is kick the can down the road. Sometimes in diplomacy, there's no point in trying to solve the problem. There is a status quo that everyone can live with uh, and just let it keep going, uh, which is better than any effort to resolve it, because any effort to resolve it raises existential issues for both China and Taiwan. Youth unemployment was north of 21% in June, and then the Xi government decided not to publish employment data anymore. It's the youth who led the Tiananmen protests in 1989. As the economic woes and the uncertainty for the younger <clears throat> generation grows, does it increase the chances of more Tiananmen-style protests? Yes, I, I think that I think one of the myths about China is that you know the U.S. tried to engage with China and thinking that uh, that you know as it became more uh, market more of a market economy and more integrated, it would it, its politics would change and nothing happened. Uh, this isn't exactly right. First of all, the U.S. largely engaged with China to, to integrate it into the world and. If you remember in the 1970s, this was the world's largest rogue state. Mao was funding revolutions all over the world. But if there was a hope and an aspiration, was that as it, China becomes more of a middle class society, more integrated into the world economy, its people would want greater voice of, in some way, and the system would become more uh, open and pluralistic in the way that has happened in Taiwan, in South Korea, in uh, Hong Kong, in uh, Malaysia, you know, and, and so much of East Asia has gone through this, this same process. I think what happened here was that she realized that things were, were moving in that direction and decided to clamp down very tightly. She recognizes precisely that as you create a more middle class society, you get more demands and more uh, of, of uh, people wanting more of a voice. And so he's been shutting it down right? along across the board. He's crack, cracking down on the private sector, on, so, on NGOs, on any kind of uh, open media there was. Uh, will he succeed? Um, in the long run, I still tend to think you cannot have five, six hundred million people who are in some way educated and middle class and give them absolutely nothing in terms of their, their participation in the political life of their country. Uh, it just feels like that is going to be a very hard balancing act to pull off. And it's precisely in moments like these, when you have downturns, when you have crises, when people feel, wait, we need, you know, we need some voice in this. We don't want one guy or 10 people in Beijing making every decision for us. So I, I, I mean, you call me naive, but I tend to still believe that the, the power, the, the, you know, the, the desire of people to have a bit of a say in their in their political life uh, is is a universal one, um, and you know people who say it's you know Chinese culture is different. I say to them, go to Taiwan. Taiwan is as Chinese as China is culturally, but it is by you know by most rankings today it is Asia's most consolidated liberal democracy. Sure. For a moment, let's pivot from China to Russia. Now that Yevgeny Prigozhin is dead. Uh, is the threat to Vladimir Putin's reign over? Is there still the prospects of another Prigozhin-style insurrection? How do you see the Russia story play out from here? I think Putin is pretty strong. I have never believed the view that you could, you could foment some kind of a crack in that regime. He has spent 21 years building what he calls a vertical of power. There is no opposition to him uh, within the political system in, in Russia. There is no opposition within the state. Uh, this, was, this is the product of, a, frankly, a kind of mistake that Putin made. 
Putin wanted to get some dirty jobs done in Africa, in Syria, and he realized that it was easier, easier than using the Russian army, which creates all kinds of issues of, you know, state-to-state -state involvement. Uh, is the Russian army involved in, in um, Africa? Then this was a kind of a, a simpler way to do it. This was a, this was a way of using your, your own commandos. <coughs> and you had plausible deniability. You could say, you know, what are you talking about? These are not Russian soldiers. I have no control over them. That's what he did in Ukraine, remember, in 2014, where he said these were just volunteers who went in and took Crimea. And then the operation went, got out of his control because Prigozhin, you know, has a big ego. He was doing fantastically. He was bringing, he was uh, raking in hundreds of millions of dollars. And then he, you know, he, he in a sense got too big for his, his, his uh, boots and Putin had to rein him in. And Putin reined him in the traditional way. Putin has reined in every office, uh, opponent of his by killing him. So I don't see this as suggesting some great crack within the Russian regime. It reminds you that Putin maintains his power through a very brutal application of force and power. Um, but I don't, I don't see that as therefore resulting in any unravel. Are we any closer for it to some kind of uh, end to the Russia-Ukraine war? Or do you see this go on for months and years from here on? I think we're further away than we were. Because I think the, there was a hope that Ukraine would do better in this counteroffensive, put more pressure on Russia, and it's proving very hard. Uh, the Russians have dug in. The Russian army has learned from its mistakes. Uh, you know, and remember, Russia is a huge country. It's uh, 10 times the size of, of Ukraine. Uh, and as something I've been, been worried about from the start is that at the end of the day, the Russians have one thing historically, which is staying power. They, they stay with stuff for a long time. But the Ukrainians have that same part, too. They're not about to surrender, all of which tells you this is a stalemate that's going to go on for a long time.